Hello everyone and welcome to this, another episode of GDDV100, Game Theory 1. My name is Kasanis. Guys, in the last episode, we took a look at design thinking and coming up with our stated design problem or our problem statement. Today, we're going to take a look at game design methodologies. We're going to talk about top-down versus bottom-up and holistic design. All right, everyone, let's get started. Okay, so what exactly is a design methodology or a game design methodology? It's really and truly design methodology is a tool that allows you as a designer to move through a thought process. That's really what it's for. It's there to help you organize your thoughts into, into, uh, into action. That's really what it's there for, to help you move from a problem to a final product. There's a lot of different design methodologies. There are a lot of them. We're going to really talk about just those two today, top-down versus bottom-up and holistic. That's what we're going to talk about today. There's not one best design methodology. Whatever works for you, whatever helps you move through the design process is your methodology. But this is just a starting point for us to start taking a look at what this means. So let's start with top-down versus bottom-up. I really like to teach this approach. Uh, a lot of people are already working like this and they don't even realize it yet. So really what we're doing here is, is really just putting uh, a name to what you might already be doing. I like to discuss top down versus bottom up with beginning designers with my, with my first year students because it's really simplistic and it, and it, it makes sense to people. They, they understand it. Uh, my only problem with it, and we'll get to that in a second. My real problem with it though is it is a it's a really linear way of thinking about things. And, and I personally don't really think that I, I, that I think that way. I don't just move in, in one line. But like I said, as a design methodology, if this helps you, then that's exactly what it's meant to do. Okay, so let's take a look at what this, this concept is, top down versus bottom up. We can look at it as a pyramid. We've got concept on top, Context, Mechanics, and Pillars UX. If you look this up online, you're going to see a lot of different words used in this type of diagram. Uh, the words that are used change, but the ideas that are, are based, that those words are based on, don't. All right, so if you're looking this up elsewhere as well and you've come across my video, uh, there might be a different set of words. And sometimes there's even, there's even five uh, different categories within here. I like to keep it down to four. That's really what I like to do, keep it down to four. Now, concept is what we're trying to make. That's the, the design goal. That's what we're aiming for. That's kind of our finished product. The context is the underlying lore. So what is, what is, your, what is your idea based in? It's the underlying lore, the narrative, the world design, that kind of thing. Mechanics are the underlying rule set, the underlying structure that allows players to interact with your game. And finally, aesthetic pillar UX, and again, like I said, there's lots of different words for this, uh, is the experience that your player is going to have with your product. So if we take a look at this from a top-down point of view, it means we start from the specific and we move into the general. All right. The difference between top-down and bottom-up is specific to general or general to specific. In top-down, we are moving from the specific and into the generalized ideas. We start with concept. With concept itself in place, the designer already knows what they want to make. And a lot of students work this way. I find a lot of students have an idea and they've already gone, they've got that idea and they want to run with it. They want to make a, they want to make a side scroller, right? They're going to be making a side scroller and that's what they're going to do, all right? So they've already got their concept there. Afterwards, they're going to add in the narrative. And again, a lot of students come to me with an idea and they say, I want to make a side scroller and it's going to be a Star Wars side scroller. You know, they say these things. So they've already got their idea in their head and they already have this narrative idea or this aesthetic, a, 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 a game aesthetic, not a game, excuse me, a physical uh, aesthetic <laughs> that they want for their game. They already understand their underlying lore that they have that they want for their game and they want to incorporate all this kind of stuff. And the mechanics then are informed by that context, right? If I've told you, you've got Star Wars, you know you're going to have Stormtroopers, you're going to have Darth Vader, you're going to have Snow Walkers, you're going to have all these different things that are already built into the lore of that particular, uh, that particular genre. And that lore is going to define the mechanics. You're going to have to have lightsabers, so you're going to have to have sword fights. You're going to have to have lasers. You're going to have to have these things. Your, your audience is expecting it. And then finally, by making these mechanics, by including these particular mechanics, you are defining the experience that your player is going to have. 
they're going to experience gunfights. If you if you're playing a stormtrooper, you're not probably not the stormtrooper who is uh, who's you know working in the in the in the cage somewhere handing out you know blasters. That's not what you're doing. You're not that guy. You're not the the quartermaster and trying to figure out. You maybe you might be. That could be a cool game, uh, but that's probably not the game you're making, right? You are probably making a game where you are a stormtrooper and you're running through. Especially if it's a side scroller, you're running through and you're you've got you know your flying jet packs because they can fly now. Uh, and you've got your lasers and you're shooting things as you run, right? All this is going to define the experience that your player has. So the great thing about Top Down, and as I've already figured out, is it's really strong if you've got a game that has a strong world design or strong lore associated with it. It's great for narrative-type games where you have uh, lore that you want to include to make sure that your game is, is defined by that particular genre. Right? And the mechanics themselves come along afterwards. They're completely defined by that lore. So here's an example. I want to build a first-person shooter. You've got your concept. I want to base it in a gothic horror world. That's your context. By understanding what you're going to build as a first-person shooter and understanding that it's in, it takes place in a gothic horror world, you're definitely going to have very particular things you have to include. Right? A gothic horror world has vampires, werewolves, silver bullets, blunderbusts. Uh, swords and candles. All of these things are going to be used to define your mechanics. And what does that mean? So the context itself are going to define the systems that you have and the, the mechanics that are associated with it. I want to kill vampires, as an example. That's a combat system. As soon as I say I want to kill something, there's going to be combat involved more than likely, right? So it's going to define for you a, a system that you're going to create. You might understand that you have to have uh, stakes to kill a vampire, and those stakes do two times. A wooden stake does two times the damage that a that a, a regular sword does, as an example. Or silver bullets, for example, does two times the damage to vampires. I should have used that. It's written down here. <laughs> wooden stake instantly kills vampires. I should have read ahead in my notes, I guess. Anyway, all of these mechanics are defined by the context. You're going to create a fast-paced horror game. It's a first-person shooter where you're killing vampires. Your mechanics are now defined by that lore. Awesome. Ultimately, your, your, your players are going to have this fast-paced game. So here's a real-world example. In my Masters, I had decided I was going to explore the idea of tangential learning. And my children at the time really loved Pokemon. So I really wanted to create a Pokemon game uh, for kids. That's what I wanted to do. But I wanted to explore the idea of tangential learning. So I wanted to include mathematics in there as well. I wanted my kids to be able to learn math through the Pokemon world. My kids weren't able to to read any of the computer games that were available. They, they couldn't read a lot of the words at the time. They were difficult for them to read. Uh, and they didn't have the strategic understanding to be able to play a trading card game, right? They loved the trading cards. They loved the art. And I knew that. They loved the art. And they liked to collect these cards. They thought that was fun, but they couldn't understand the actual trading card game at all. They, they lacked uh, this tactical understanding of the game. So with that being said, I had defined what I wanted to create. I wanted to create a board game uh, that included a, uh, a math component and that uh, was based in the Pokemon world. I understood my concept. I understood the lore. The lore was there. I already had the fact that these... these uh, wild Pokemon were going to be available in long grass. I already had the idea of how to catch, capture a Pokemon. You capture it in a Pokeball, right? So I had all of this stuff. All that lore defined, defined how we played our game, the mechanics I associate with my game. And ultimately, I created this particular game that taught children math. That's what it does. If you want to play this game, I have created this game on Tabletop Simulator for my Tabletop Simulator series. It is absolutely available and absolutely free on the Tabletop Workshop. The game itself worked out really well. I moved from the specific down through the down through to the general, where my children end up having a, a a fun game that they were playing. All right. So I knew that ultimately my children were going to be exploring a map. I knew they would be exploring the long grass. This, these are, this is what the UX, this is what the, the pillars of my game were. Exploration uh, and math. <laughs> That's what it ended up being. And it worked out really well. Anyway, give it a try. It's on Tabletop Simulator. Have fun with it. The next idea is bottom-up. So instead of top-down, we're going to take a look at it from bottom-up. 
So with a bottom-up approach, we're really allowing the, the aesthetics of the game, the pillars of the game, uh, the player's experience to define the game itself. That's the entire approach. We have an idea of what we want our player's experience to be, and we create a game based on that experience. So let's take a look at what that means. In this direction, we've got ourselves really strong mechanics. We've got ourselves a really well-defined player experience, but oftentimes we've got a problem with the context. We've oftentimes got a problem with the underlying lore, right? It seems like it's often added on. Uh, I, I've got my ideas, and now I just kind of add on the story afterwards. It's, it's added secondary, and, and the story is only there to justify the mechanics that we've decided to add to our game. If we take a look again at a, uh, as an example, uh, if you want the pillar of your game to be exploration, and you want your players to be very methodical about it, well then your mechanics are gonna allow your players to move through areas of a map, let's say, that are hidden, they're, they're disguised, and that's gonna define, if you want this to happen, uh, it's gonna define several different things, a movement system, a mapping system, as an example, right? This is gonna help us define our systems. Once we understand that we have a movement system, we have to understand how the player moves, and we're gonna define then the player's movement mechanics. All right. We have to define, again, if it's a map that they're revealing, because we're, we're basing it on this idea of exploration, where we want our players to, to move into undiscovered areas. We're going to have to understand how that map's revealed. If it's all shown at the same time, well, that kind of wrecks the idea of, of exploration, right? They can see everything. Uh, we want to keep some information back. So how are the different areas of the map revealed? And then finally, we can end up with, a, with context. We already know the mechanics. We already know what's happening. The, the map's being revealed. It's all about exploration. We can then throw on there, I'm an archaeologist, or I'm Christopher Columbus, or something like that that allows us to utilize those mechanics. And ultimately, then you can say, I'm creating this type of game. So a third-person camera space exploration game, as an example. Um, or you know, an archaeologist uh, discovering uh, ancient civilizations games uh, as they move through uh, an undefined map. Something like that. It's going to allow us to go from the bottom up, from these general ideas up into the very specific, as we've just seen there. Now, once again, in my master's, I took on two projects in my master's. I took on a board game, which we already discussed, and I did it from the top down. My original idea is I wanted to explore the idea of, of economies within games and whether traditional mechanics or traditional economies within a particular game define the genre of games, right? So... I wanted to see if I removed traditional mechanics from a game or I removed traditional economies from a game if we would still have a the same type of game, if it could still be defined as a particular game genre. So that was really my pillar. I wanted to remove this, these ideas and see if we still had the same game. Um, I decided that I had uh, what I had was a, a game loop that I wanted to create, and that game loop um, was all about... Uh, it was my, my core loop was about uh, adjusting... Um, adjusting pieces on a board uh, so they fit properly on the board. That's the, the idea I came up with. I wanted to build a city builder and being a city builder that had no uh, that had no economies really other than the economy of time. I guess that's not true. Everything has an economy. But it didn't have the traditional economies of collection and maintenance of resources and utilizing resources to to build on a particular uh, you know advancements within within the game. All that stuff is what a, a city builder is normally based on. I decided that I was going to build a, with my game loop, it would make a really nice city builder. So you could add uh, different sections and your, your city would build. So ultimately what I built was a puzzle-based city building game. Uh, and it ultimately looked like this. So this is, this is what the world is. You, you solve each of these little squares as a puzzle and the city itself uh, came about. That's what was created. And again, understanding what a city builder was was really important to me. Was it about... Those traditional economies was it about those those uh, uh, traditional mechanics or could you build a city builder without it and and that's what i tried to do within this particular concept but i began with the experience that i wanted my players to have i really had a, an interesting core game loop that i wanted to to utilize and that's really what bottom up does bottom up really gives us the opportunity to work from these base ideas it's really strongly based in the mechanics of a game uh, but unfortunately, oftentimes, as you saw from my city builder, it wasn't really a city. It was more of a, you know, geometric shapes. Um, but it, it allows us to work from this, these core ideas, these strong mechanics to give a very particular, uh, particular type of experience to our players, right? And then everything else kind of gets added on afterwards. I had an awesome game loop that I really enjoyed. And by expanding that game loop, I was able to create a city builder. All right. The next thing we're going to talk about is the idea of holistic design. 
And really, uh, this is kind of a, it's my own personal methodology. It's not something that you're going to find out there. This is how I found that I, I like to work. So as I mentioned, this is my own personal methodology. Uh, and really the way it came about is I sat down one day and I was thinking about how I produce the stuff that I produce. Is there a, a particular way that I work? And I did find that I wasn't moving linearly through the process that I, I moved back and forth. And that's really how this came about. And you're going to see that it mimics some of the ideas we talked about earlier when we talked about design thinking and the process of design thinking. So let's take a look at what this is. Um, I found top down versus bottom up a little bit restrictive. Uh, I didn't like that, that pyramid, pyramidal shape. Uh, I didn't move linearly through my ideas. Uh, I, I kind of moved in all directions. I'd go back and forth between my ideas and, and redo things. And, and just like we talked about in design thinking, I would have an idea, I would prototype that idea, and then I would play test it. And this, this, this iterative loop um, is really what I found that I was doing very often. So this is the holistic design. And you can see it's a circular shape, it's not pyramid. Again, we are, and that's the big difference, <laughs> it's circular. Um, the, uh, you can see that, that we've included some of the ideas of design thinking in here. It's about understanding our problem clearly, moving from that, bro that problem into what we call our design target or our design goal. It's all about refinement. It's about changing and iterating your ideas until you ultimately have what it is that's going to solve the problem that you've defined. And that's what's really important having a clearly designed, a clearly defined design problem. Without that, we can't really move forward. We can collect or create that design problem uh, through the collection of data, uh, through a research, through observation, through immersion, uh, just as we talked about when we, when we spoke about the idea of design thinking. And it is with that clearly defined problem that we can then start to look at the other things like the context, the UX, and the mechanics. As with top-down versus bottom-up, UX pillars refers to the experience that, that we're looking for our player to have. We want our player to have a very particular experience. It's our design intent. When we talked about the idea of systems in an earlier video, it's our design intent. Our system here has a design intent. What do we want our players to experience? Context, again, refers to the idea of narrative, underlying lore, world building, and that type of thing, the story behind whatever game it is we're creating. And mechanics refers to the rule set that allows our player to interact with the world or the game that we're creating. It is only through these mechanics that our players are able to interact with our world, right? It's only through what we define, the ways that we define our players are allowed to work with our game that they can do so. So that's what the mechanics are. In this particular case, movement can go anywhere along this layer, right? I might have an idea of what experience I want my players to have. I might go in and add a few uh, mechanics in there to define that uh, those particular pillars, go in and write some context, move back and forth between any of these ideas. The direction is is around the circle or outwards or inwards, right? There's, there's no linear movement here. You can move in any direction. The design target is the output of the method methodology. It is the solution to our design problem. That's where we're, we're ultimately moving from the, the general, so from the idea that we have as far as the problem, into the specific, here is what we're trying to produce. And this methodology, I found that in my own work, that I was moving back and forth. I was going through this iterative design. So even though I, I came up with what I thought was my design target, after testing, I found out it's not. It's not exactly uh, what I had in mind, and I had to go back and move through the process again, right? Go back maybe one step and maybe change some of the context. The people didn't, the people didn't uh, react well to the story I had in there, so I can change my story a little bit. I can tweak my story. It's all about refinement until you finally have that design target that allows us to, to solve our design problem okay so it's not about moving in one direction it's about moving in any direction you need to to be able to get the job done and to really understand what the design problem is and I found this is how I worked this is ultimately how I worked and that, that's really what I ultimately had to do uh, an example of this I created a game called nether runner and again uh, this was a game that I created uh, at a game jam but for my kids I, I do a lot of <laughs> A lot of game design for my kids now that I'm a professor and I, I don't actually work for studios anymore I find that I'm doing a lot of personal games <laughs> for my children and, and making my own family happy uh, Nether Runner uh, 
was a a side scroller that was built on the ideas from Minecraft. My kids love Minecraft, so I took a lot of those ideas and I moved them into into this game called Nether Runner. It was a side scroller where you could uh, run through the overworld and uh, by missing a jump you'd fall into the Nether. And it was only through the, by dying in the Nether that the game ended. So it was kind of like a, a, a double chance that you have in order to play this game. If you fall off the, the first set of platforms, you can keep running. And you could return back to the overworld by collecting uh, specific items, specifically obsidian blocks. So you can hear just by what I'm saying that there is a ton of lore that already exists, all this Minecraft lore that already exists. And the ideas behind the mechanics already exist when I say I'm creating a side-scrolling uh, platformer. All those mechanics are there. I have to be able to jump. I have to be able to, you know, at least be able to jump. That's my core mechanic, right? I have to be able to jump. Uh, I also had to create platforms, so I needed systems that would be able to create platforms uh, for me. Uh, I needed to be able to, uh, my player to be able to interact with certain things. And again, with the context that existed, I was able to pull context from Minecraft. So I was able to add diamonds and add gold and add swords and add, you know, helmets and iron and lava and all that kind of stuff. I was able to add the, over, the overworld and the nether. All that kind of stuff was already there. And the pillars were already defined because the genre of side-scroller is well-established. So I was able to take the well-established pillars that exist. You already know that if you're doing an infinite runner, it's all about uh, appropriate timing. It's all about seeing how far you could go. It's all about challenge, uh, having our players be able to challenge themselves to go farther than they were before. All of these things are already defined. So I had all these ideas. It was now about putting them all together and creating this design target, right? And, and, and producing this design target. All right, guys, that takes us to the end of this particular video. We talked about the idea of top-down versus bottom-up methodology, and we talked about my personal methodology, my holistic design methodology. There's no right one. There's no wrong one. If something helps you move through your ideas, then, then you are doing things correctly. Uh, you are probably already using a methodology just like I suggested here. I was already using a methodology and I just really kind of sat down and, and wrote out what it was. You're probably already doing the same thing. Take some time and think about how it is you work. Maybe there's already an existing methodology uh, that will help you out as well. All right, guys, so I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, let me know down below with a thumbs up or a thumbs down is perfectly fine. This is not for everyone and I understand that, but it is ultimately for my students at Centennial. This is the lecture section, the asynchronous lecture section that is being built for my students so that our in-class time, our synchronous time uh, being held on, uh, on different, um, different media sites where we're gonna be able to interact synchronously. Uh, this is going to be kind of the precursor. They're gonna watch all this stuff and then we're gonna have in-depth discussions about these ideas in class. All right, everybody, I hope you enjoyed it. Like I said, thumbs up or thumbs down, both perfectly fine. Thumbs up, thumbs down, comments down below, and if you haven't done so, please take a few seconds to subscribe. Have yourselves a wonderful day, everyone.